Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Nick Barley, and I am the director of the biggest Anglophone literary festival in the world, <laughs> in Edinburgh. <laughs> and so it is a great honor and joy to be here at the biggest Francophone literary festival, and to be twinned with this fantastic city and with these fantastic audiences to talk today about a very important subject. First of all, I would like to say thank you to our interpreters who are translating so brilliantly. Um, we were together in Brazzaville in February and uh, I'm delighted that they're back again today. These debates are about why the novel matters. Why, why do we write novels now? Why in this digital age do writers continue to use the novel as a form which they prefer. When, as a reader, it takes us maybe a few days, maybe even a few weeks to finish a novel. When there are so many easy ways of consuming ideas on the internet, why does the novel still matter? So this is, can, are you okay? This is the reason for these discussions today. But there's another important reason for these discussions, and that is an historic reason. 50 years ago, in Edinburgh, these same questions were asked to authors who came from all over the world to, to discuss them in Edinburgh. Norman Mailer, William Burroughs, and other authors from across the world discussed national identity, censorship, and politics. And so 50 years later, Michel Lebris and myself and other festivals from around the world decided to ask the same questions. Has literature changed? What are the differences between now and 1962? 1962, when it was still the, the Cold War, when it was the era when homosexuality was still illegal in many countries of Europe. Things have changed now in the digital age, but maybe these questions are still relevant. And so, in this enormous worldwide project, we've been asking these questions all over the world. Uh, Brazzaville was one wonderful example of, of taking the conversation to authors who have, whose voices have not been heard and whose voices were not heard in 1962. We've also been to Beijing, to Siberia, to Toronto, Cape Town, Berlin, and there are still there are, uh, manifestations in Sri Lanka, uh, Trinidad, Trinidad still to come. It's a very big project. And so, in this context, it is a very special pleasure to welcome Velibor Cholic to make a contribution to this debate. As you, I'm sure, as you, I'm sure you know, Velibor Cholic has an extraordinary story to tell, an extraordinary history which began in his home country of Bosnia, where he was born in a village which no longer exists. He joined the army and then he deserted the army and came to France in 1992, where he's been living as an exile ever since. Velibor's story is extraordinary, and to talk about national identity in this context, I think is a very, very special moment. And let me assure you, he has written a most astonishing, powerful text. And I urge you to listen carefully, and afterwards to make your contribution to this subject. And so please make very welcome Velibor Cholic. Thank you, merci. Hello, everyone. I hope you're well. I know this is a Sunday morning. Today's theme is is there such a thing as national literature? Uh, people say I'm Yugoslav, and so I've decided to entitle my text The Warrior's Cry, Nationalist Literature. And before I start, I'll drink a bit of water. It's uh, quite a long text and it's well written, so it's all going to go well. And of course, I'm modest. <coughs> During a visit in Switzerland, 
A journalist asked Ernesto Sabato, Mr. Sabato, why are there so many epic novels and poems and myths in Latin American literature, whereas we hardly have any here in Switzerland, if at all? Look, young man, Sabato answered. When William Tell missed his son, you missed your one chance of a national tragedy. <laughs> this paper doesn't question national literature and certainly doesn't claim to be based on science. Rather, it is a bitter observation. The line between national and nationalist literature is very fine. Unfortunately, back in ex-Yugoslavia, I was the witness of an elitist literature, which suddenly became a national literature, where first writers came and through their books and their national language defined the spiritual and national space of the people. Then came the military to outline the borders proper. And this, of course, led to a triple crime, genocide, memoricide, and herbicide. If you don't mind, I'll stop on those words, those terrible words. Memoricide first, and then herbicide. What do those mean? Recent wars in ex-Yugoslavia have added the word memoricide to the long list of contemporary horrors. It means erasing any presence of the other, any idea of coming from an other culture, religion or language, past, present or future, in order to reinvert a version of history with military means. Herbicide, which literally means killing a city, is a word used by the former mayor of Belgrade, the great architect Bogdan Bogdanovic. He used this expression when he complained about Yugoslav cities that were killed during this senseless war. Not just any city, in general the cities destroyed were among the most beautiful. Vukovar, Dubrovnik, Sarajevo, Mostar, the most multicultural, the most cultural by definition. Those cities were symbolic of something that didn't fit into nationalist projects. During the siege of Sarajevo, the Bosnian army managed to intercept a talkie-walkie conversation. The Serbian general, Ratko Mladic, was ordering his colonel to bomb the city. Yes, sir, said the colonel. But you haven't given us specific targets. Who cares, said the general. Just shoot, you can't miss a city. That's herbicide. In his novel, Koreni, published in 1954 in France, the writer Dobrian Kovic, nicknamed Tolstoy of the Balkans, the father of the Serbian nation, who'd go on to become the future ex-president of Yugoslavia, Serbia and Montenegro, concocted a manifesto for a national literature infused with Balkan juice. According to a spellbound critic, his great rustic and family-oriented roman fleuve, addresses and glorifies Serbian cults of freedom, their ancestral and national mythology, their patriarchal despotism. And according to the same critic, it also magnificently denounces the Europeanization of Serbian intellectuals, the destruction of the farming world and of individualism. The result being the uprooting of the people and even the complete disappearance of the nation. In 1954, the nation, made up of farmers who were patriarchs and traditionalists as well as libertarians, had the same enemies as today. Europe, cultural diversity, the West, cities, 
individualism. So the Tolstoy of the Balkans was in favor of a proper, homemade, serious, perhaps boring and tragic national literature, in which, according to Kozic, Serbs always lose in peacetime what they gain during the war. In this literature, which isn't entirely devoid of interest, more objective observers discovered the premise, which has since been emphasized and argued in Chosic's works, of the country's future woes and the premise of this triple crime committed genocide, memoricide, herbicide committed by Chosic's very own disciples. And a good example is Radovan Karadzic, head of Bosnia Serbs, who was a psychiatrist and a nationalist poet. A writer's involvement in a war is never direct, but it seems to me that the root causes of this evil lie in this so-called national literature. It recognizes our soil, our spiritual borders defined by language and religion. It more or less openly accuses our neighbors of being the true enemies, the communists, the Albanians, the Turkish Muslims in Chozic's works. Or it points the finger at hidden enemies, which is much more insidious because that includes everyone, anyone. The Serbian and then Croatian or Bosnian nightmare started precisely at the time when the masterpieces of Chozic and his disciples became a political project. And when their novels started being read as history school books and vice versa. And this confusion between genres, between history and literature was a tragedy for everyone. The distinction between myth and reality lies in intelligence and common sense, in the ability to distance oneself and to reason. But unfortunately, new national literatures work on an emotional and collective level. They inexplicably erode convictions that were set in stone. And at that point, there is but a step between national and nationalistic literature. When there is but a step left, writers step aside and give way to the military. During a recent televised debate on the French governmental project of Marriage for All, Mr. Eric Zemmour, who, according to Wikipedia, is a French writer and political journalist, so writer and political journalist, according to Wikipedia, he explained the violence of, of some anti-gay marriage protests as the result of the May 1968 events in France. I swear, I'm not lying. And according to him, Protesters of 1968 were demanding freedom, so individualism, so ultra-liberalism, and the children of today want to get rid of a politically correct world that was imposed on them by 1968 rioters. The idea of a national culture, of a national way of life, which you find in speeches such as Zemmour in France or speeches in the Balkans, all originate from the same place. This idea stems from shortcuts, ready-made wording, the reinterpretation of history, Holocaust denial, populism, nationalism. and so on. Once again, we see that nationalist literature behaves like a chameleon. Back in ex-Yugoslavia, we sometimes call it patriotic literature. Regularly, we call it traditional literature, and very often we call it popular literature. I'd even go so far as to say mandatory literature, the one and only. In his book, the Balkans, The Terror of Culture, published in Belgrade in 2008, Ivan Cholovic, the Serbian ethnologist, talks about the national, cultural and spiritual space of the people and about the para-literature that feeds off this holy trinity, 
that the nation represents. Yet, in a multinational national state where religions and cultures are manifold and blended, such as all ex-Yugoslav countries, despite attempts at ethnic cleansing during wars, this idea of one space, one language and one literature is problematic. The common points between different nations, the origin, the language, the mentality, is that they are analyzed, cut open, reinterpreted, as are all the weaknesses of our spirituality. Because national, nationalist literature is by essence exclusive. No other literature is tolerated, least of all the national literature of our neighbors. The form and the essence of national literature go against modernity. Generally, novels of that genre are written in an outdated language using popular and anti-elitist wording. Long poems intentionally blur the lines between ancestral epic tales and the current and usually tough situation of our nation. Ivan Cholovich gives an example. During the latest war in Bosnia, in the middle of the battleground, Serbian soldiers cried out names of heroes from popular literature, as though bringing historical evidence to support the idea that their fight is universal. And now, if anyone here wants to become a nationalist writer, here are a few tips. It pays well sometimes, but you know. So in the name of the people, here are a few tips to becoming a nationalist writer. I've failed, but it's not too late for you. I was kicked out of my own country. National literature goes against world citizenship. In this Weltanschauung, we wash our nation of all its sins and turn it into a metaphor. Our homeland is no longer a country or a state, but often it is a pretty young woman who's been raped and tarnished. Our nation is also the cemetery of our grandfathers. It is our religion. It is a white dove or a mother. Recent national works of Serbian, Croatian and Bosnian writers show our motherland as a sort of monster, always expecting that we give our blood and life for it. A popular Croatian song says, do not be sad, O oh mother Croatia, call us. Just call us, and like falcons, we'll sacrifice our lives for you. Despite money, glory, and power, in these parts of Europe, it is not easy to be a national writer. But it is worth sacrificing everything, absolutely everything, even the nation, for the nation. Thank God I'm not in my country. <laughs> I'm already in a tough spot. But never mind. The golden age of national literatures in Southeast Europe matches the end of communism. This evolution was first seen in dissident writers, then in those who left communism, and then in self-proclaimed nationalist bards. Of course, they received the full support of the church and of new freshly and democratically elected powers, which represented the renaissance of our people. Nationalist literature always speaks out in the name of the people with heroic rhetoric. It tries and succeeds in finding scapegoats, it makes our enemies visible, and it always either accuses or forgives, always in the name of the people. True writers need time and silence, whereas their nationalist colleagues need a stage. Well, uh, I'm on a stage, but you know, a stage, a crowd. The, they need sound and fury, blood and tears. This shoddy and wholesale literature only sees humanity in very simple terms, 
good and bad, us and the others, victims and perpetrators, just like American Westerns. The good guy always wears a white hat and the bad guy is a black one. In this epic and eternal struggle, we are the good guys who defend true values, whereas on the opposite side you have the barbarians whose names and faces may change, but whose nature stays the same. It is wild, destructive and decadent. A world as simplified and divided as supporters in a football game. As a rule, this type of literature should stay where it belongs, at the margins of this world. But unfortunately, behind the wanderings of my country's heralds, lies a real tragedy, a fratricide war with over 100,000 deaths and 2 million refugees. Among those responsible for this massacre, some writers rank high. Their patriotic tirades, their works and their call for war still find an echo in victims' heads like a gruesome celebration. National literature is like a church. Everything in national literature is sacred. Our soil is sacred, our language, and most of all, our freedom are sacred. It is also necrophiliac. In that literature, writers are either already dead or about to die on the altar of the nation. In patriotic texts, we, the righteous among the nations, are no longer truly human. We have no name or occupation. We are neither married or, nor single, tall nor little. We have no personal destiny, only a common one, which, of course, is tragic. National writers prefer to see us as victims, victims of the spread of Islam, of globalization, of various world conspiracies. We are but a handful of brave and lucid people who stand up to a rich and cunning and ruthless enemy. Before the war, said uh, Serbian satirists, we had nothing. Then the Germans came and destroyed everything. A national writer always has a bone to pick, but first and foremost, he is a sentinel who safeguards our language, which is vital and essential for any writer. The problem is that our language never fits the borders of our country. In order to correct this anomaly, there's always a drunken drunken colonel ready to free the people all by himself. A German philosopher said, repeat tragedies can become farcical. And I would add, unfortunately, repeat farces can become tragedies too. Just as hell is other people, borders are other people too. These imaginary geographic and political lines are like thorns in the soft flesh of humanity. For a long time, everywhere, we've lived with our walls and our languages, our norths and our souths, our rich and our poor. Borders are also our gods and our colors, our faces, gypsy moustaches and Jewish noses, Aryan grey-blue eyes and the plump lips of a jazz singer. For a long time, we've made and destroyed empires, democracies and dictatorships, and we've lived at ease within our communities, not with others. In order to change or to protect our borders, the military wage war incessantly and the writer, the last customs officer, still standing at the border, tells the story. This narrow space, stuck between the arrogance of invaders and the destiny of their victims, which is stuck between all those borders, can become mankind's new geography. Great history is but statistics, whereas literature names and tells the small tragic comedies of mankind. It doesn't seem like much, but to me, it seems worth it. Is 
Let's hope that after the era of politics, which is only a perverted game that we will eventually have to put an end to, and after the era of crazy and bloodthirsty national bards, will come the era of literature. A nomad and humorous literature, a mobile and multicultural literature, disheveled, undisciplined, without visas and without passports. In 92, during the war, I wrote a text in my soldier's logbook. Perhaps it was foolish, certainly naive, but I was frightened. I wrote it as a Kardish of sorts for my country. This text is entitled Believing in Literature. Stupid, really. In times of war, believing in literature means not accepting ready-made wording, not choosing necrophilia or death as biblical necessities symbolized by the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It also means working on the magic which makes words come together and recognizing evil and condemning it. That is how, in Bosnia, we can go beyond a purely aesthetic literature. It means time and again remembering the bright and sacred nature of the sacrifice of victims in order to believe in meaning again, in order to breathe new life into literature without thinking about the fact that this story has already been told numerous times. It means believing in the primeval cry of life, as wise and old as the hills. The cry of the child who, pushed by survival instincts, tears his mother's womb to announce the clear and definitive triumph of creativity over absurdity and violence and destruction. Yes, that is what believing in literature means. A literature that cannot be altered because it holds the secrets of life's eternal nature. Only a few months later, the soldier I was went into exile and this text, which I'd written on my knees in the trenches, became a book. They, a gypsy proverb says they can kill off all the swallows, but they won't stop the arrival of spring. Merci. Nos amis écrivains fascistes serbes croates, ils ont eu un peu les oreilles qui sifflent. Fascist serbo croats friends probably worried right now. Valibo, I think on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank you for that incredible contribution to this debate. In a moment, because I think it's so profound what you've what you've written here. I'd like to ask you just to read again the, the uh, Croire en littérature that, that you wrote in your, in your book in a moment. When you've had a, a, just because it's so profound, I, I, I would like to hear it one more time. But first, I'd like to come away from this incredible set of ideas to take you back to Brazzaville, um, where a similar debate took place in February, and where there was a very different kind of mood. Um, and I want to ask you about that. Because in Brazzaville, there was an important sense that a national identity through, can be expressed through literature as a means of escaping from oppression, as a means of doing precisely the opposite of what you were suggesting, where literature could help lead people towards freedom and away from colonialism. And the tools for doing that were the imagination, were a language um, which is not French or English, but another language. And so the Congolese writers who, who spoke in that debate were arguing precisely the opposite of what you suggested, that a national literature can be a force for good so how, how do you 
how do you feel about this, the, the possibility that national literature can be useful? Oh. We could perhaps move directly to uh, some of the Congolese writers in the audience. Um, oui, un micro arrive. Je peux vous demander de, de vous lever, de vous If you would please stand so people can see you. And please introduce yourselves, uh, says Vélibor. Uh, My name is Henri Lopez. Bravo. First of all, congratulations, because I express it by clapping, but I would like to say it with words. What a uh, beautiful uh, text you have read to us. This, there's another question that arises. as it, Just as individuals, we don't have the same story as our neighbors or as our brothers. No community, uh, no country, let's talk about countries, let's not talk about nations or states. No country shares the same history. No two countries share the same countries. And what Nick emphasizes, and I'm very pleased that he did, is that without contradicting what you're saying, there is another piece of this uh, world landscape, this puzzle. For us Africans, when it comes to history, we were ignored, forgotten for a long time. Colonialism was not merely exploitation of our uh, national resources and enslavement. It was the very negation of the fact that we were men, that we had a culture, and that we could produce culture. Yesterday, I recall, something that was said uh, by a character in one of Jules Romain's novel. The black race will never be able to produce a Gershwin, nor an Einstein, nor a Mozart. Maybe that was not the order. I'm just quoting from memory. So for us, the first movement uh, that was expressed, I believe, in the Negritude movement consisted in saying, we exist. And we exist because we too have a history, a different history. And we had to bring it back up to the surface. In this movement, a national literature appeared. I personally believe that the writer is not, as I like to say uh, about football, is not in an army, he's not a flag bearer. The novelist and the poet as well, I believe, who's after all his twin brother, is in the same situation. We are in a problem in relationship to ourselves and in relationship to others. Yet, and in spite of this, because our nations are brand new, and because there are times when we feel of ourselves that we're national writers, not fascist, not nationalistic, but national writers. Imagine a writer from Botswana who comes here to Samaro, who's uh, at a book signing event. And uh, his color, if it's authentic, because uh, I, I have neither the color nor the name that is authentic, uh, is already worthy of interest. Oh, it appears that in this country uh, they also write, don't they? But uh, they might pass by and not buy the book. Now, take that writer, put him back to Botswana, into Botswana, into his environment, and you will see immediately that all uh, Botswanians will come to him, will flock to him, and turn him into Michael Jackson, their own Michael Jackson. This is uh, where the debate lies. And in conclusion, I want to say that even for us, we have a completely different uh, story than the fascinating story that you recounted. I hope you don't, because it's uh, not something to be hoped for. That was an interjection by Velebor Cholic. Mr. Lopez, the difference is that you had uh, wars between nations, so to speak, and we had internal conflict. 
So the danger in saying that one is a national writer is in terms of what you produce. A national writer, in our understanding of the word, is a writer, is a writer who is regionalist. He could even be a village writer. And this writer will be judged according to criteria that are probably far less demanding. He'll be a bit of a, you know, a, a, a king leading the blind. Um, and that's our requirement. There they go. Well, that's already quite remarkable an achievement. And again, I'll just say something in English. So <laughs> thank you for continuing to use the casquette. Um, in, in a moment. But yeah, I'll, I'll give the parole, yeah? Okay. Um, I just wanted to recall the history of the novel, and I think Germany um, is important in this context. The novel, as we know it today, was born in Germany, before Germany was a country, uh, when Germany was a whole series of small cantons. And the writers there wanted to express that Germany was coming together as a nation, and this was in the late 18th century. So the novel as we know it today is relatively new. And that national identity was expressed through the romantic novel. And of course, we know the, the long history of Germany, which led through to nationalism and Nazism and all of the things that followed. Now, I think that uh, it seems to me, Bellebo, that you're expressing the the worst part of that narrative arc for, for Germany when the novel went from national identity through to bad nationalism. However, I think it's important to mention that we are sitting here in Brittany, um, a region of France where I think there is much pride in the traditions and the language of, of the Breton culture. And so it's important to express, just as it is in Congo, that there can be some positive aspects to uh, an expression of national identity through literature. You see that several times uh, I may have gone on too long, but I said, uh, in our land, uh, Serbs, Croats, etc. Actually, I was referring to the extreme cases. I was a journalist. I had uh, a jazz, uh, funk, and uh, rock uh, programs on radio. And let me tell you a story. The journalist. Uh, uh, youth and uh, the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde uh, transformation. Anyway, the first free democratic uh, uh, elections, inshallah, as we say in my country, in 1992, took place in 1992 in Bosnia. And the people had already been very much instigated by the press, so we Serbs. It started in 88 when they started to say the Muslims, that is the Bosnians, are not like us in 1990. Uh, Bosnians, they're not at all like us. And by 92, we have to exterminate them. The free elections, the people from the extreme left, uh, the communists, they just simply flipped over to the far right. I wanted to look like a Ziggy Pop, and I had very long hair. So I saw on a Sunday the results of the elections, and by Thursday I was out of a job. I was 27 years old. I had a head full of literature. Uh, James Brown, Otis Redding, and uh, all of that in my head. And I came to work and I was told, young man, uh, go see the manager. And I went up to the director's office and I asked, what's the problem? Uh, and on uh, Friday it was comrade director, and then by Wednesday it was Mr. Director. And who do I see? An enormous man big glasses, who stares at me. 
I'm quite uh, tall, and I tried to make myself very small. And uh, I, I said I had all kinds of bad sex pistols, etc., and very long hair. And so this man, the new director, looks at me. And it's all about the birth of fascism. I see the name and the surname of uh, a program director. Some of the names are underlined in red, which is always a bad news. And then I see the uh, schedule. I had a program on black music, jazz, soul, funk on Wednesdays. It was a fantastic uh, program, and it was very popular. And uh, he looks at this, the programming schedule, and he uses the familiar form, and that's very uh, fascistic. That's an ideology of proximity. You right away, you do away with the formal form, you go to the uh, familiar form. What are you doing here? And I said, uh, Mr. Director, I don't really do important things. It's people for young. It's music for young people. And he looks at me, and this is where I saw for the first time a fascist. He sees my program, jazz, rock and roll. He looks up, and he says, "Uh huh." Let's see. You're showing nigger music, and and um, um, uh, insane uh, homosexual British music. And uh, and I said yes, comrade director. And he said, out. We don't need that here. And it's then it's an intellectual professor of philosophy. A man speaking uh, Shakespeare's language. A man who knew by heart, who could recite by heart Goethe, who said, "You're, uh, you're showing, you're, you're putting on the air nigger music and uh, degenerate British homosexual music." And I went down, and I took a few uh, John Coltrane records and said, "This, this is really not fun anymore." So when we talk about national literature, okay, in the 19th century, because Slavs, Austrians, but at the end of the 20th century, in this point of view, after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, in a very complicated country with four religions, even fifth, since uh, football, after all, is a religion. I mean, soccer, sorry, soccer is a religion. So you... A fifth religion. So at that time, there was this uh, uh, horrific transformation. I was very young. I was 26 or 7. I wrote books. I thought uh, that uh, we can change the world. That uh, and that we. It's all about love. And that was the end. That was in November 1991. In February 1992, we had war. Be careful. Be careful. Beware of the extremist everywhere. Fortunately, in France, you don't have that. Kenneth White. Je suis Kenneth White. My name is Kenneth Écrivain White. I'm Scottish. Établi en France depuis maintenant quelques but, uh, années. J'ai quitté la Grande-Bretagne pour des raisons que j'aborderai rapidement tout à l'heure. Juste à temps pour mes 60 ans. Et ce que je essayer de faire, j'ai pris quelques notes et j'ai griffonné uh, quelques petites idées. Ici, notre ami Mathieu Lebrun nous donne une petite plage. And if you don't mind, I'd like to uh, uh, talk about more de ce qui a déjà general été dit. Je voulais dire en préambule, en préambule seulement, themes. que now, by way of introduction, I'd, I'd like to say, I'm sure you don't mind, if I say that in literature there isn't just novels, there are many types of literature, and in Germany, novels are a big part of literature, and novelis, the writer said, the art of writing books hasn't yet been invented. So there are a number of experiences in literature which aren't yet in the novel. That was the first thing I wanted to say. Now, I'd also like to say I've worked in Croatia, in Montenegro, and so on. I've talked to Bosnians, Croatians. They weren't nationalists. So, and uh, I'm sure you know some of those as well. 
Some of my books, in fact, are written in those languages. As for what's just been said, I'd like to say I'm aware of what's happened because I've spoken to Emi Césaire a lot and for years. So what I'd like to do is to say that beyond humor, which is necessary, and beyond anecdotes, we need to widen the topic. And so I'd like us all, whatever our background, whatever our nationality, to admit that today we live in globalism. And in the name of profit, is capable of destroying everything just to make money. And that's probably the biggest danger that we're facing. So we have this globalization. And then you have reactions that go to nationalism or localism. So you have a number of sides. I don't belong to either of those sides, and I think most of you are in that same boat. I'd like to talk about an open world. Now, we don't have time to develop this idea, but I'd like a more open world. I come from a country which, for the first time, analyzed this murderous capitalism, thinking about the riches of the nations of Adam Smith, who was a literature professor in Glasgow, in Scotland, where I myself studied. Adam Smith says, and I saw in the newspaper that Adam Smith was seen as the father of capitalism, and that was rubbish, just like a lot of things you read in the newspapers. Adam Smith isn't doing the apology of capitalism. He's just analyzing it. In, in his essays, he uh, tries to envisage what will happen. He was a visionary, and thank God there are people like that. He forecast that there would be a time where, when education would be looked down on, where culture would be in vain. There'd be lots of things, events around culture, but there'd be lots of idiots. And that the only values would be those of the markets, financial markets. And books would be sold on markets just as socks are. That's what he thought. And I'd like us to ponder over what was said almost two centuries ago and to think, have we... Are we now, is our current world the one that was described? Well, a book fair is nicer looking than a market where you sell socks, for sure. Yes, I said humor is essential, but I'm just trying to do something else. Whilst also, laughing, if you could be brief, because we need other contributions as well. Les seuls écrivains qui m'intéressent en fait, c'est ceux qui ont quitté cette situation-là, qui ont essayé de quitter cette situation-là. So writers who wanted to move away from that did it. Intellectual nomads, Nietzsche in philosophy, Rimbaud in poetry. And what did they do? They left their nation entirely. Rimbaud left France, went through Scandinavia, and ended up in Abyssinia. He traveled the world. Rimbaud left Germany, which he hated, left Germany. So they both were intellectual nomads. They crossed cultures. Okay. I think we, we can come back to you. Okay, we have another contribution in the middle. Merci, monsieur. Merci. Thank you.
Oui, je, je ne suis pas capable de, de faire une analyse aussi générale. Là, donc moi, je viens de Belgique. Vous appelez euh, comment Je suis Je suis de Belgique. Mon nom est Geneviève Dama. Euh, ce qu'il y a, c'est qu'on a été un pays jusqu'en 1830 qui a été chaque fois traversé par notre peuple. Et pour euh, donner un peuple, pour se mettre en peuple, il ne faut pas le connecter à sa culture. Criss -cross by another people. Donc, And, um, nous avons appris les Belges, même si après, une fois qu'on a eu la dépendance... Oui, les Belges, même après l'indépendance de notre pays, nous ne sommes pas très fiers de ce que nous avons fait en Afrique. Mais nous avons été taught de ne pas connaître notre culture. Quand j'ai étudié à l'école, j'ai appris l'histoire de la France et de la France culture. Je n'ai pas appris l'histoire de la Belgique ou de la littérature belge. Aussi, maintenant, j'imagine que vous le savez, on vit en Belgique, c'est extrêmement difficile. Donc maintenant, comme vous le savez, nous allons passer par des moments très difficiles en Belgique. Nous allons passer par des moments très difficiles en Belgique. Because there's a very significant surge of nationalism, which is actually facilitated by the lack of knowledge of what was fought, uh, experienced, and learned in a territory. And it doesn't mean that you need a uniform literature, but what we're seeing now is there's a resistance of uh, writers who don't want to be identified as being uh, Flemish or Wallon. They want to simply be associated with a literature that questions what is going on in that space. And in Belgium, I'm talking about literature that's written within those borders. And uh, Belgium is extremely multicultural. We have people from every possible imaginable um, origin. I think it's very important to know what was written, what took place within the boundaries, within the land, but not to be confined by it. Hi, uh, my name's Ian McDonald. I'm a writer from, ooh, oh, hang on. Uh, a writer from Northern Ireland, where we kind of understand these things a bit. Um, I think there is a way of finding a unity between the gentleman from Brazzaville and the, the gentleman from, uh, from Bosnia, in that as writers, we do not take food from the hand of the king ever. Our position is always to see where the power is, and that power can be the um, that power can be the oppressive nationalist state, that power can be the former colonial power, that power can be economic. But our position and our job is always to see where the power is, to look at that power, to analyse it, to ask questions of that power, because in that lies good writing, good character, good story, good tension, good drama, and stories that will live and have meaning and will reveal more about our identities, our religions, our, our genders, our nationalities, than actually going to, rather than kind of a, taking a pure national position. So I think, as writers, our job is never, ever take food from the hand of the king. <laughs> OK. Very <laughs> So here we, we have three important contributions. We have um, capitalism and Adam Smith. We have the Belgian situation and the multicultural nature of Belgium. And we have the Irish situation. Do, did you want to respond to, to this, particularly the, the notion of capitalism and globalization? Ah. Bon, capitalism. Capitalism. Well, I always say, that I was born at the end of communism. And I left my country at the end of communism, at the twilight of communism. If I go to Belgium, then it will be a mess. Okay, capitalism then. As far as I remember, it was a soft dictatorship, but a dictatorship nonetheless. And Tito, a magnificent character, as all communist dictatorship, great whiskey connoisseur, 
uh, loved very young girls, castles, and so on. So for us, capitalism, and this is probably stupid and naive, but for us, capitalism meant freedom. I was, I'm probably the only one here to be absolutely spellbound by supermarkets. I don't know, my cousins say, oh, I have to go to the supermarket, whereas when I go, I'm amazed. I'm probably also the only one to think that Stuttgart is an amazing city. It's deception. It's my dad is fairly sad to see that. My dad's 76, he's still a communist. And our generation is a bit disappointed. West is the best, that's what we used to sing. Fuck the rest, is how it went. So capitalism, as we saw it, was due to the fact that we were disillusioned. And Paris was the most romantic city in the world. And going towards a more general analysis, Milos Dorman, when he went into exile, said, what was the difference between capitalism and communism? He said, well, both are wild animals, except in Prague, they're in a cage, whereas in New York, they're free to roam. That's the difference. But you get wild animals everywhere. Thank you, Olivier Weber. I'm a writer and a journalist. Um, I was quite touched about what you said about this fine line between national and nationalist literature. And you talked about powers in place and future powers, political powers, which do anything to ensure that they remain in power. In Velibor, you were saying that earlier when you talked about these literatures in Bosnia, ex-Yugoslavia. I've just come back from the region, more specifically of Knin, Croatia, which uh, Knin is a city back there. But it's also Krajeva's old capital city. But it still exists. And after the war, the Dayton Accords don't date back very far. Uh, and people said, well, your father killed me, then uh, you, you've killed my father, then I'll kill you. And we know that most casualties are civilians. And Henry Lopez said earlier, that perhaps we should go towards more cosmopolitan literature or world literature. Because our literature is often rooted into a particular country. So how can literature strive for globalization of more world, more world literature? And that's the real challenge in literature, wherever it may be, in Damascus, Baghdad, and so on. I am always amazed to see young people writing, uh, reading novels, short stories in other languages. And there you can see that values are passed down. So literature is a borderless country. And so as long as you can read and write, which isn't a given, I suppose, but as long as you can, then perhaps we should strive for world literature. Just, just quelques, quelques mots, moi je suis plus je suis français entre guillemets, plus je deviens the more French I become, the more I become a Hugo Bosnian. I don't quite know what the word is, but we're, of course we're made in from our the place we were born. 
It's not the same thing being born in Sarajevo or being born in Zurich. It makes us what we are. I have a diploma in literature and uh, Yugoslav literature. That's not what uh, made me a writer. It's a horrific experience of uh, war. Even if I've written a lot about modernity and jazz, uh, still I go back to those roots that are forged from where we were born. And then we have our own personal baggage, which is uh, more or less uh, easy to defend. Me, as a Bosnian, I often get the question, are you working on a new novel? And I say yes, and, and they say, "Is it still on?" And I, and I think of uh, Paul Auster. Of course, I, I can't be really compared to him. He's a great writer, but uh, Paul Auster gets asked the question, "Are you writing your novel?" And he's saying, "It's always about uh, New York, you know." So the people are marked, typecast, uh, pigeonholed. And then there's my unpronounceable surname, to such an extent that the Italian uh, uh, immigration officer says, uh, first page, oh, he's Caucasian, Oof, got that over with. Second page, name, surname, weird. Third page, origins. A few years ago, in, uh, uh, in the airport in uh, Milan, he was so annoyed that he couldn't get me on anything. This is a Berlusconi type cop, and he sort of me. He said, "France is really a very is really not a serious country. They give papers to everybody." Okay. <laughs> so it really marks you. Uh, let's open the floor to those who are not writers. Uh, who who is, believes in Brittany? On m'entend. Uh, vous levez, vous dites nos prénoms, <laughs> date de naissance. C'est mon côté éducation communiste, date de naissance. Est-ce que vous avez fait service militaire? <laughs> On m'entend ou pas? Si. Alors, je m'appelle Tanguy. My name is Tanguy. I was born in 1996, and that means I'm 17 years old. So that means that I did not know, I did not go through 68. I did not even know about the Bosnian War. Uh, and the only way I learned about it was through uh, uh, history classes and uh, literature and, of course, uh, through uh, YouTube. I heard some people say uh, that it seems uh, extremely disturbing for uh, us as young people that there is a national literature and nationalist or nationalistic literature. And as a reader or as a person who likes it, I don't have a feeling that I'm read only one type of book. I can read uh, Big Bidi, I can read uh, Nabokov, I can read any number of writers and books. And to understand a country and its culture, we also have to read what was. For the power, even if it was, uh, it goes back uh, La Fontaine, he was also denouncing society, but he was also reflecting his society. And uh, Victor Hugo, same thing. He was denouncing all kinds of things about his society, including capital punishment. So I think what will happen over time, and I hope this will be the case, is that the border, uh, the boundaries between certain countries and cultures will gradually uh, vanish. I don't feel that I belong to something so specific. You know, French culture has uh, forged me more than something else. It's because it's closer to me, it's uh, more accessible to me. But I don't think that French literature is just French literature because we're French. It goes far beyond. And that's better because uh, we'll, we'll be able to see further and doors will be open. We shouldn't worry for us. We'll, we'll manage, even if we read a lot less than you do. Thank you, says Lady Bor. I want to ask all of you something. Michel Welbeck, is he a totally individual writer or is he a French writer who says something about French identity? It's a question that comes to me over here. Should I stand up? Hello, my name is Cédric Mabilotte. I'm very happy to be here today to share everything that we're hearing. I would like to say a couple things because uh, the uh, attempt to uh, bring this back into a more general framework was a bit lengthy, but it's interesting. All of us, we are 
what we are. We've been made what we are. A man uh, has his particular way of viewing the world. We have our own sensibility. We have our own feelings and our own thought processes. And uh, the difference for writers is that he expresses his reason. He's an actor of thought. And to give some form of unity, we talk a lot today about globalization, the fact that we can't escape our common destiny. We think we have an individual destiny, but we're seeing that the development of interconnections between economy, the economy, culture, and thought uh, has uh, condemned us, has doomed us to get along. Yes, we express what we feel from our point of view as we go around the world, and the writer who decides to share his thought with the rest of the world becomes a, somebody who shares something that is, in essence, local. We have personal stories, all of us, but when we talk about national culture, what we find is that these identities are often artificially constructed. And to be slightly provocative to our friends from Brittany, the history of the uh, people of Brittany, is it the real history? Is it the reinvented history? Or is the myth of the nation? There's the people and the nation. And there are many parallels with the period during which uh, nation states were created, where you essentially populations were reinvented. I mean, peoples, what did it mean to be a peoples, a tribe? And this for nomadic people who ranged over vast territories and actually intersected with other cultures and other peoples who had their own vision of the world. All of this was rebuilt and national identities were rebuilt. So we talk about refocusing on the topic, which is national literature. It's really interesting to see how uh, from the nationalists you can sort of uh, drift to nationalistic. But what is national is interesting insofar as it's part of our identity. But what we're finding is nations that believe that they were nations were only just a, a blend of different peoples. If you look at the Armorica and the Britons, they have a shared a richness, and they together form a kind of identity. Yes, there's a, a national identity in the sense of uh, being it being local, but it has to be shared. And thanks to the writers for this. Answered about Britain. Do we have a Breton in the room? Does anybody want to answer? Sinon, il y a ce monsieur là au centre. D'accord. Attendez un instant. On a un Breton, oui. Non, alors, alors après. D'accord, monsieur. Alors, une sassane. Now, in this question of national literature, there's also the notion of existing. Why don't we talk? Why do we talk about a national identity? It's because people wonder how to show that they exist. And in France, we always think, well, yeah, everything's going fine. Problems are in other countries. Take the example of a child born in another country, not in France. He arrives in France very young and he just tries to exist. How is he going to exist? Well, TV. Often these days it's TV, maybe literature, uh, music. You were lucky enough to, to hear about James Brown very young. In Bosnia, I heard about it very late on in my life in France. And when I was young, when I turned on the TV, I was thinking, where do I exist in that TV? At the time, there was something called Recré à Deux, a program on TV, and in 1982, I started existing on TV because there was a cartoon on TV with a big black cow called Noiraud, Blackie. And when I went to school, finally, I meant something. I was Blackie, the black black cow. <laughs> and then I existed through other things. But it was difficult and it took time because I was always brought back to slavery 
Africa and to something I didn't actually know. Earlier, the person next to me asked me, what country are you from? And I said, well, I don't know anymore. Just because I was born elsewhere, I was born in Senegal, I know hardly anything about this country apart from Mafé and Chebuchan. But does that make me someone from Senegal? And then the other question is, how do I exist without uh, creating fantasies, without uh, pretending I'm François Non uh, or Aimé Césaire, uh, without being my heroes? And how do I talk about tomorrow without talking about my past? Because nationalism is often based on the past. And it, may, it fixes the notion of literature on a past that was better than today and probably better than tomorrow. As the young guy was saying earlier, let's trust the future. Let's trust the new generation. And let's get rid of the borders that are in our mind. During the war in Bosnia, I remember that on TV in France, we'd not seen cadavers on roads. But we saw dead bodies on roads in uh, Côte d'Ivoire, in Rwanda. We were shown dead people. Why? Why was that? Why do I say this? I'm saying because if we saw a dead white body, that would mean something to us more than a black body. So let's get rid of those borders in our minds. And let's stop saying you're French and in order to look French, you have to look like this. Thank you. Well, uh, there are no degrees in suffering, I suppose. A few years ago, here in St. Malo, there was a debate. Uh, Jean Nasuelde was among us. He lost part of his leg. And he was awkwardly trying to explain that there was a scale of choices. Uh, supreme horror was the Holocaust, and then there were different gradings. And I said to him, if one day a dictator only kills uh, 15,000 people, what happens then? I said to him, you have to be careful. When I suffered, I screamed in Bosnia. And I thought everyone was waiting for my scream. In August 92, and I was saying, well, the Germans were going on holiday and we were waging war. Yes, there is always someone who tells you something and who reminds you of something. I met, I met a Jewish guy who went to France in 39, and he said to me, for 50 or 60 years, I'm French. And sometimes I forget, and when I was young, uh, whenever I tried to forget that I was Jewish, there was always someone to remind me. For two or maybe three more contributions, and then one final contribution from Villibor. So, first, first up here, Henri, and then up after. Jacques. Donc Jacques, euh, français, oui. Je me sens de plus en plus French, citoyen yes, du monde. Britain, no. J'aimerais bien être de plus en plus nomade. Ce que j'ai vraiment But I feel myself to be increasingly a citizen of the world, and I would like to be more nomadic. What I found truly uh, fantastic uh, in what Vélibor has shared with us is his uh, uh, humor, but this uh, term that he came up with, herbicide, it's even worse than genocide because uh, uh, there are others who are left there, but if they only have the memory of uh, those who have been killed, it's memoricide. This is what we see everywhere in Belgium and in African countries as well. What I find really amazing is to hear our man from Glasgow who talked about Adam Smith. When I studied economics, I remember the invisible hand of Adam Smith. This is what explains a triumphant uh, capitalism, which is not really in his twilight 
It, it still gives us the choice to have uh, literature as socks, or elitist or anti-elitist or popular literature. But what is really amazing is the mixing and the blending. We talked about uh, music, cultural mixing, uh, hybridization. It's not globalization. Uh, there's uh, globalized music. We don't know all about this, Eurovision, etc. But what we have is uh, the richness and the creativity in the mixing of musical uh, genres, which show us that it, it is, goes beyond what we're being served up. And uh, it's what our Irish friend told us, uh, literature is also a way to resist, is a form of resistance, any form of power. And we saw it yesterday when we talked about censorship. Here, uh, there's a convergence. Uh, we are all citizens in all forms, be it uh, poetry, literature, uh, drama, all art forms is of thinking or thinking of by ourselves, as Anna Arendt says. And this is how we close the loop. We come back to the beginning. So uh, let's not, uh, let's call things by their name. There's no uh, ideology, there's no you know, sort of dominant ideology of capitalism. And it's all the different art forms that in a way constitute ideology. I don't like that word, okay. Uh, in, in 1968, I was sort of a Maoist like everybody else, and I saw just how uh, uh, just how devastating these ideologies can be. So how can we create an ideology that's not an ideology, but that is something in the form of resistance? In front, and then Henri Lopez. I, I just want to dovetail or piggyback on what was said. Nobody talked about uh, métissage, that is the mixing. Um, the intermixing or hybridization, I hesitate to think to talk about it because people think have I have complexes about it for very obvious reasons. And I think I maybe did not express well what I wanted to say earlier because uh, like many other writers, we really only express ourselves well in our writing. So I want to read you a very short excerpt from a work, the title of which is uh, very topical, My Bantu Grandmother and my uh, forefathers, the Gaulois, the Gauls. My Bantu grandmother and my forefathers, the Gauls. I write because I'm African, a man uh, aged several millions of years whose memory and imagination only holds on the very tenuous thread of a very foggy oral tradition a man whose library is less than 100 years old. I write to introduce into the imagination of the world beings, landscapes, seasons, colors, smells, tastes, and rhythms that are not part of it as of yet. To say to the world the four seasons, that is the rainy season, the dry season, to say to the sky where you see um, uh, where you see different stars, different constellations. But Africa is not to be told in the form of repertoire. It's not to be told in the form of an ethnology or sociology uh, essay. Or, and Tom, uh, sorry, in the country that I talk about doesn't exist in a Michelin guide, in no uh, writing by uh, travel writers, in no history or geography textbook. It's uh, from my own inner geography that I talk to you. And then further in my text, I write to uh, take on my uh, blackness. I write uh, to uh, untranslatable. Poetry has been quoted, untranslatable. But I basically write to go beyond my blackness and to raise my prayer to my forefathers, the Gauls. Gauls of all races, I mean, of all languages, of all cultures. Because it's for me that Montaigne was an American Indian. Uh, Montesquieu, a Persian, and Hambo, a black man. Shakespeare wrote his uh, tragedies. Montpassant wrote his short stories for me. And I write to have the strength to live in the country of solitude, the country of uh, hybrids. Very, very brief. This lady here at the front. 
Just very, very, very short. And if you could stand up. Bonjour, je m'appelle Marie-Christine. Hi, my name is Marie-Christine. I just wanted to go back to the word globalization, which covers a number of things. I think we should prefer the word of Edouard Glissant, who isn't talked about enough. He talked about mondialité, and he's also talked about the all world. I would, I would like to thank all of the contributions, um, and I would like to finish today by asking Vallebourg to read once again his, uh, the text that he wrote on his knee when he was in the army. Vallebourg. Merci. Répétition. Et croire en littérature. Believing in literature. Let's hope that after the era of politics, which is only a perverted game that we will eventually have to put an end to, and after the era of crazy and bloodthirsty national bards, will come the era of literature, a nomad and human literature, a mobile and multicultural literature, disheveled, undisciplined, without visas and without passports. In 1992, during the war, I wrote a text in my soldier's logbook. Perhaps it was foolish, certainly naive, but I was frightened. I wrote it as a Kardish of sorts for my country. This text is entitled Believing in Literature. In times of war, believing in literature means not accepting ready-made wording, not choosing necrophilia or death as biblical necessities symbolized by the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It also means working on the magic which makes words come together and recognizing evil and condemning it. That is how in Bosnia we can go beyond a purely aesthetic li literature. It means time and again remembering the bright and sacred nature of the sacrifice of victims in order to believe there is meaning again, in order to breathe new life into literature without thinking about the fact that this story has already been told numerous times. It means believing in the primeval cry of life, as wise and old as the hills, the cry of the child who, pushed by survival instincts, tears his mother's womb to announce the clear and definitive triumph of creativity over absurdity and violence and destruction. Yes, that is what believing in literature means. A literature that cannot be altered because it holds the, secret, the secrets of life's eternal nature. Only a few months later, the soldier I was went into exile, and this text, which I'd written on my knees in the trenches, became a book. A gypsy proverb says, they can kill off all the swallows, but they won't stop the arrival of spring. Thank you. Thank you.